Today, as Judge Amy Coney Barrett's prospective employers, I thought we should take a moment to go through her resume. You know, why she's going through the old job interview process. And I mean literally go over her resume, as she's required to submit one as part of her application. Specifically, I'm going to go through her hand-selected top 10 list of legal decisions that she's authored. Let me tell you, it really reads like a greatest hits playlist for the deepest levels of legal junkies. Before we get to that though, let me provide you guys with a basic summary of her legal philosophy so you know what to be looking for when we start breaking down these decisions. Judge Barrett is a devout follower of originalism, a judicial belief that we should interpret the laws the way the people who wrote them would have wanted them to be interpreted. Ask Ben Franklin whether the government tracking cell phones through radio towers without a warrant is a violation of constitutional privacy law. A shock based coronary and a few hundred thousand questions later and you'll have yourself an answer. Now you can expand this philosophy forward as well. For example, as the 1960s Congress that passed Title IX discrimination protections, whether protection based on sex includes protecting transgendered and homosexual individuals. Oh boy, you're probably going to get a very offensive answer to that question. So with that in mind, let's get to her decisions. Her all time favorite decision, stick this one on the fridge, is her dissent in the 2019 case of Cantor v. Barr from the 7th Circuit Court. Oh yeah, we're starting this list with a gun rights case, really hitting the ground running. Our story starts on May 4th, 2011, when Ricky Dr. Comfort Cantor pled guilty to mail fraud after shipping prescription chew inserts to Florida that he claimed were Medicare compliant when they actually weren't. I bet he isn't really a Dr. Comfort either. Unfortunately for him, that sort of mail fraud is a felony and he did time, specifically one year and a day in prison. Remember that one year and a day, it's about to come back. Unfortunately for him, Wisconsin law prohibits firearm possession by persons convicted of a crime punishable by imprisonment for a term exceeding one year. Equally unfortunately for him, his year and a day conviction didn't fall on a leap year, so he wasn't permitted to buy a gun. The question facing the court in this case was, is restricting this non-violent felon's access to a firearm a violation of the second amendment? As you can imagine, when it comes to the centuries and centuries of gun lawsuits, the pathway is pretty well worn by now. Justices ain't shooting from the hip these days. There is a two step process to figuring out whether a law violates the second amendment. First, is the activity being challenged, in this case felons buying guns, explicitly not protected by the second amendment? If it was explicitly not protected, case over, hit that gavel and let's grab an early lunch. Take for example the Supreme Court explicitly ruling that you can't buy weapons intended for use in the battlefield that are not in common use at the time for lawful purposes. That case was specifically about a sawed off shotgun because it is old as heck. So if today you were to sue your state arguing that you should be allowed to buy a weapon of war if maybe you're over 30 because second amendment. That case would be thrown out without even considering the merits of your argument. Because uh, we already ruled on that and we said you couldn't do it about a century ago. On this question of felons being explicitly not protected by the second amendment, the justice is really punted by saying, well, some laws do refer to law abiding citizens, but I don't know, go ask your mother. This brings us to question number two. If the action in question is definitely protected, or there's a bit of a gray area, does the state have a compelling interest in restricting this gray area? Here the circuit court ruled yes, because the government has shown that prohibiting even nonviolent felons like cancer from possessing firearms is substantially related to its interest in preventing gun violence. Therefore, he can't buy a firearm. Remember though, we're analyzing a dissent in this case. Her main concern was not with the state's compelling interest in selling firearms to non-violent convicted felons, although you bet she had some thoughts on that. 
but instead she set her sights on the entire two question structure that had been set up by the Supreme Court to address Second Amendment concerns. She illustrated her argument with maybe the least sympathetic group you can imagine. She writes, Imagine that a legislature disqualifies those convicted of crimes of domestic violence from possessing a gun for a period of 10 years following their release from prison. Not sure I love where this argument is going. If the justification for the initial deprivation is that the person falls outside the protection of the second amendment, it doesn't matter if the statutory disqualification expires. That's that 10 years going by. If domestic violence misdemeanors are out, they're out. Basically, in her opinion, if a group of people, in this case domestic abusers, fail the first test and are deemed explicitly not protected by the second amendment, they won't even get the opportunity to get to question two, where they actually challenge the potentially unjust firearm laws against them. Now I'm going to summarize a very long block of text here, but if you don't believe me, feel free to pause and analyze it for yourself. In her opinion, the way the process should work is that the court should assume that everyone and every action is protected by the second amendment, and then work backward from that to exclusively figure out how much legislatures can restrict those gun rights. Of course, under this logic, I'm sure that the first regulation everyone could agree to is no gun sales to violent murderers. But hey, at least under this logic, violent murderers could challenge restrictions in court. I'd hate to be that lawyer though. This is originalist because it throws away a huge pile of court decisions and returns to the brass tacks of what the laws say. So that was her all time favorite decision. Moving on to the silver medalist, we come to Yafai v Pompeo. This case is a lot simpler than the last one. So a Yemeni man became a naturalized citizen and wanted to bring his family over. They applied for visas and were rejected because the man was found to have previously tried to smuggle over his kids. This decision is a bit unclear on the next point, but it seems like the family argued that the kids they had allegedly attempted to smuggle into the country had previously died. Don't worry there though, the details aren't that important. So they submitted proof of death certificates, and just when you thought the story couldn't be any more of a bummer, those documents were found to be inconsistent with testimony and led to a reaffirming of the early, earlier visa denial. The visa applicant sued, claiming that the visa officer had acted in bad faith and ignored evidence. So the question facing Barrett's court in this decision was, do we have the right to intervene and even answer this question? Barrett's majority answered with a resounding no. Congress has delegated the power to determine who may enter the country to the executive branch, and courts generally have no authority to second guess the executive's decisions. Again, it's just not up to the courts to question the will of Congress as long as that will doesn't rub up against the constitution in Barrett's point of view. Because of that, the court couldn't question that decision so the declined visa stood. Was that really your second favorite decision though? Wow, talk about a drop in impact from A Numero Uno. So now to the bronze with her dissenting opinion in Cook County v. Wolf. Now this is one of those Webster's Dictionary battles where we're arguing definitions of specific words in a multi thousand page act. The specific phrase here is, what is a public charge? Now in this case, the Immigration and Nationality Act provided that a non-citizen may be denied admission or adjustment of status if she is likely to, at any time, become a public charge. Yup, that phrase is pretty pivotal. Of course though, nowhere in the act did anyone think to define what a public charge was. Eh, you'll know it when you see it. The rub in this case is that the Trump administration came out and said, well, we're just going to edit public charges Wikipedia page and for the purposes of us enforcing this law, we're going to define it. Their definition included immigrants whom the executive branch deems likely to receive public assistance in any amount at any point in the future. So when faced with a definitional question like this, there are two main ways of answering it. 
Would the Congress that passed the act find this definition acceptable? Or what do we, as a court interpreting the letter of this law, thinks makes the most sense given the context? The majority of the court agreed that, even assuming that the term public charge is ambiguous and thus might encompass more than institutionalization or primary long term dependence on cash benefits, it does violence to the English language and the statutory context to say that it covers a person who receives only small benefits for a temporary period of time. Whoa, tell me what you really think. Of course, in this case, we're analyzing Judge Barrett's dissent, and she said, hold on a sec, let's hear what the Congress that passed this would think rather than what they wrote. By saying that their past intention doesn't make sense in the context of this larger bill, you might be taking the power of legislating away from the legislators in Congress that passed that law. So now some of you might be worried because, Oh boy was that bill passed a while ago. Don't really want to be taking immigration advice from our ancestors. Oh simple, a public charge is anyone who's going to be on Medicaid, or receive food stamps, or is Irish. Dirty Catholics. We're not going that far back in time though, because we only have to go back to the 1996 congress that amended public charge rules to give them a bit more bite. She finds that when the use of public charge in the Immigration and Nationality Act is viewed in the context of these 1996 amendments, it becomes very difficult to maintain that the definition adopted by the Department of Homeland Security is unreasonable. So she argues that, had the Congress in 1996 been asked if small short term aid is a public charge, they probably would have said, sure. Her dissent argued that's how the court should rule even if it doesn't make complete sense in the broader context of the law. Now to fourth place with Doe v Purdue University. Quick apology to Purdue University, I'm sure you're great, but this is not about to turn into an advertisement for your college. Now I'll be honest, there are a ton of moving parts in this case, and you can get really into the weeds, like I did on the first draft of this episode. Let me just hold down that delete key and cry for the next 20 seconds. So a John Doe was found guilty of sexual assault of a Jane Doe at Purdue University and was punished accordingly. It was a real he said she said court case and the school believed the female. The John Doe appealed the case alleging that the investigation had been improperly conducted and therefore violated his 14th amendment civil rights as well as his title IX gender protection rights. The school's magistrate declined to review the case saying that the John Doe had failed to demonstrate any proper legal arguments. So the question facing the court in this case was, did the John Doe have a case at all? Now before I get to the meat of the issue, Judge Barrett seemed keenly aware of the fact that, in order to answer this question, you're going to have to take a very unpopular viewpoint. The decision was filled with asides saying things like, our task is not to determine what allegations are supported by the evidence, but to determine whether John is entitled to relief if everything that he says is true. Basically, if everything the boy says is true, does he have a case? At its core, Judge Barrett found that his 14th amendment claim did not hold up because getting suspended from a college didn't constitute depriving him of a tangible property right. Ha! That's right, in America an education beyond high school level is a privilege not a right. Oh, I don't know. This was between him and the school. But it was found that the school legally labeling him as a sex offender, if the many mishandlings of the investigation were true, would limit his liberty in a way that would bring his 14th amendment rights into question. Because of that, his 14th amendment claim was ruled legitimate. Similarly, his title IX protections claim that the school had tilted the scales against him in order to continue to receive federal funding. This one is a bit more tinfoil hatty. His evidence was, again, the allegedly biased investigation coupled with an Obama era letter to the school saying, to quote the decision, 
this administration is committed to using all of its tools to ensure that all schools comply with Title IX, so campuses will be safer for students across the country. In other words, a school's federal funding was at risk if it could not show that it was vigorously investigating and punishing sexual misconduct. And just to clarify for everyone out there, that summary part I just read was Barrett, not me. So let's not shoot the messenger here. The argument was deemed plausible by Barrett's court, as the school administration had sided with the female's account despite never meeting her, and if his allegations are true, had built a case against him by ignoring evidence and proper procedure. Because those two claims were deemed legally viable and admissible, his appeal was allowed to be heard in the district court. Honestly, not really sure what the philosophical takeaway from this case is, but it was Barrett's fourth favorite decision of hers, so I hope you enjoyed it as much as she did. Maybe keep this one off the old fridge though. It'll look great right next to the treadmill in the garage. So now to fifth place in the case of Rainsburg v. Brenner. Ooh, this is a police misconduct case. It's basically just a more woke reiteration of the last decision. Detective Brenner was investigating Rainsburg, but his probable cause warrants and investigation were plagued with lies and omissions of exculpatory evidence. Rainsburg was released because of all of the flawed evidence and procedure against him. Then he turned around and sued Detective Brenner for violating his search and seizure rights. Detective Brenner said, All right, bud. Two words, qualify immunity. You can't sue me. Judge Barrett dwelt that argument a swift ka-chop, ruling that qualified immunity did not apply in this case. The reason he didn't qualify for qualified immunity was that, in order to qualify, the violation you're being prosecuted for needs to exist in a legal gray area. You can't look someone in the eye and say, Wait, you're saying we can't lie in probable cause affidavits and withhold evidence? Oh man, the laws are changing so quickly I can't keep track these days. How do we feel about murder? Still bad, right? Because of this, Judge Barrett wrote, Because it is clearly established that it violates the Fourth Amendment to use deliberately falsified allegations to demonstrate probable cause, Brenner is not entitled to qualified immunity. Ah, that was a refreshingly simple and uncontroversial case. Coming in in sixth place, we have Grussgott v. Milwaukee Jewish Day School. This case has to do with the ministerial exemption, which says that religious institutions' leadership hiring and firing practices do not have to comply with the Americans with Disabilities Act or Title VII discrimination rules. Now, if you're currently cleaning the coffee after your screen because, wait, what? That's a separate video for another day. That's just the precedent we're working with right now. In this case, Gruscott was fired from her job as a Hebrew teacher because of cognitive issues arising from a brain tumor. Not only is that a clear violation of the Americans with Disabilities Act, but also probably the Old Testament. I think it has some contrary advice on how to deal with the sick. The question facing the court today was, is this Hebrew teacher enough of a religious leader to fall under the ministerial exemption? In which case, the Americans with Disabilities Act wouldn't apply. The problem here is that when the Supreme Court created the ministerial exemption in 2012, they were a bit winging it. It's kind of, ah, oh, you'll know when you see it type of situation. Or is a special head indoors? Yep, probably a minister. Talking about religion to a group of people for money? Oh, minister for sure. Church janitor? Probably not a minister. It's a little more complicated than, hey, check his collar for a white strip. The framework she had to work with was the formal title given by the church, the substance reflected in that title, the teacher's own use of that title, and the important religious function she performed for the church. All right, her title is grade school teacher, and she used that title to teach grade school students and not Jewish outreach in the community. So far, not looking like a minister. 
On the other hand, while her primary job was teaching the Hebrew language, the school curriculum required her to integrate Jewish teaching into her classes, and she prayed and performed religious ceremonies with her students. So is she a minister, or in this case, a rabbi? Well, according to Judge Barrett's decision, yes. She found that the importance of Gruscott's role as a teacher of faith to the next generation outweighed other considerations. Because of that, she wasn't able to sue for wrongful termination under the Americans with Disabilities Act. Coming in at 7th place, we have Wallace v Grubhub Holdings. Now, This decision was a refreshing 9 pages. Ah, thanks for giving my brain a little break. It has to do with the legal rights of delivery driver independent contractors working for Grubhub and involves some pretty funny legal one-upsmanship. So Grubhub considers their independent contractors not to be protected by the Fair Labor Standards Act. But a group of drivers disagreed and sued for violations, including no overtime pay. Grubhub looked at him and said, ha, that contract you signed with us said you can't sue us for those violations. We handle that stuff internally. Checkmate. Then the delivery men said, not quite. We occasionally deliver food across state lines. Oh yeah, this just turned into an interstate commerce case, and workers involved in interstate commerce can sue in federal courts. King me. So the question facing the court today was, are Grubhub drivers who deliver across state lines engaging in interstate deliveries? Sounds pretty obvious, right? Well, the act in question exempts two enumerated categories of workers, seamen and railroad employees, as well as what we call the residual category, any other class of workers engaged in foreign or interstate commerce. I mean, it still kind of feels like technically they're good legally, right? If you take the law at its word, they would probably fall under the category of engaging in interstate commerce. Well, Judge Barrett asked the game-ending question, if Grubhub were to exist back in 1925, what would the Congress that passed that law think? Beyond, of course, geez, I need to start calling all those kids in my sweatshop independent contractors. She found that, because the act goes out of its way to mention seamen and railroad employees, the term engaged in foreign or interstate commerce only applies to an employee who performs work analogous to that of a seaman and railroad employee, whose occupation are centered on the transport of goods in interstate or foreign commerce. That does not include club hub delivery drivers, who might occasionally cross state lines for deliveries. Because of that, the Grubhub employees were not allowed to sue Grubhub for Fair Labor Standards Act violations in court. Next we have AF Moore and Associates v Papas. This case is the definition of problems I wish I was rich enough to have. So a group of homeowners assert that the local tax assessor is charging them property taxes at rates mandated by local ordinances. Well, giving tax breaks to owners of similarly situated properties. Yeah, I can 100% guarantee you're going to forget about this case before the video even ends. If their tax breaks allegations were true, that would be a violation of the Equal Protections Clause of the Constitution, which entitles owners of similarly situated properties to roughly equal property tax treatment. The question facing Barrett's court was, how do we rectify this situation? The injured party had applied for a refund, but you know how municipal governments are. They move at about the pace of a dead tortoise. They'd been in litigation for more than a decade with no end in sight. Because of that, they decided to take their case to the federal court, arguing that their legal system had not only violated their constitutional rights, but also completely failed to provide a legal remedy. This fight came down to the Tax Injunction Act, where the federales can kick down a municipality's door if they're messing around unfairly with taxes. The act provides that the federal district court may not interfere with any tax under state law where a plain, speedy, and efficient remedy may have been in the courts of such a state. In this case, though, 
Judge Barrett found that the state's remedies were not only way too slow, but also just terrible remedies even if everything went according to plan. The taxpayers were only allowed to challenge the tax rates they would pay in the future with no opportunities for redress covering the years of previous unconstitutional tax rates. Because of this, she allowed the property owner's case to be heard in a federal district court on the grounds of unconstitutionality as opposed to violating state laws. This brings us to our ninth case of the night, Castillas v. Madison Avenue Associates. Now this is a case of man versus debt collector. And I know having Madison Avenue in their names makes the company have an air of prestige. Hey, they sell nice things on that avenue. I want to get into debt with that company. But this is the opposite of a sip tea with your pinky out style debt collecting agency. So what's the story? Well, the Fair Debt Collection Practices Act applies some very strict and very specific rules to debt collectors. No need for a time machine, it is obvious to everyone what Congress wanted with this guy. A new debt collector has to send you an introductory note that says, Hi, we're Madison Avenue Associates. Nice to meet you. We'll be calling you every midnight until payment. Here's the debt we're looking to collect. In that debt notification, the debt company is required to include notification of a dispute mechanism where if the debtor thinks the company has erred in any way, they can write them back and demand they provide proof of that debt. Of course, if the debtor doesn't write back, it's just sort of assumed that everything is on the up and up and the debt has not been challenged. In this case, Madison sent Paula Castillas a debt collection letter that described the process. But it neglected to specify that she had to communicate in writing to trigger the statutory protections. Castillas noted that omission and filed a class action lawsuit against Madison. What? We forgot to include the legally mandated note that allows you to dispute our debt claims? Whoopsie! Now, this is super illegal and very explicitly banned in the act. The lawsuit exclusively argued, though, Hey, you violated this act and I got you. That's a battle in. So the company had violated both the word of the act and the intent of the people who wrote the act. You don't need overnight shipping for this book because Judge Barrett is throwing it right at you. Right? No. Wait, what? In a complete reversal of the core logic of every one of her decisions so far, she said here, let's see what the legal precedent has to say. While this case was pending, a separate case was decided and held that a plaintiff cannot satisfy, satisfy the injury in fact element of standing simply by alleging that the defendant violated a disclosure provision of a consumer protection statute. Because of that, Judge Barrett said, sure they broke the law, but did it hurt you? No, you caught the mistake. In the least legalese decision writing I have ever read, she specifically said, the bottom line of our opinion can succinctly be stated as no harm, no foul. Madison Avenue Associates Inc. made a mistake. If only you hadn't caught them until it was too late. Well, live and learn. So if this episode was a find which one doesn't fit with the rest of the pattern episode, this guy buried in ninth place would probably be the right answer. You've decided more than 10 cases, you could have left this one off. Anyways, last but definitely not least, we come to the Equal Opportunity Employment Commission v. Costco. This is a sexual harassment case, so guess we're ending this episode on a bit of a bummer. In this case, a Costco employee was being continuously stalked by a customer and sued Costco for allowing the hostile workplace to happen and continue. To establish a hostile workplace environment claim, a plaintiff must show that she was subjected to unwelcome sexual conduct, advances, or requests because of her sex that were severe or pervasive enough to create a hostile workplace environment and that there is a basis for employer liability. The interesting part of this case was Costco's concessions. They said, Okay, yeah, this stalker did subject you to unwelcome advances. And yes, you were subjected to that environment because you were a woman. And okay, yeah, we could have done more to prevent him from stalking you. 
But you know what? Was it really that bad? Wait, that's the argument we're going with? Whoa, we are not the good guys in this story. Hope no one makes a YouTube video analyzing this case in about four years. The question in this case was exclusively about whether the stalker's multi-year behavior was bad enough to constitute a hostile workplace environment. Costco was able to point to several pieces of precedent in which the Supreme Court rejected much, much more egregious acts than the stalker's occasional filming, asking of odd questions, and generally just following her around. So did Judge Barrett look at the precedent and say, Gee, it seems like Costco has a pretty good point. No way! She ruled that despite more egregious individual examples could be identified, the culmination of years of this latent harassment, even after the police and Costco management got involved, constituted an obvious example of a hostile workplace environment. As a result, she ordered Costco to pay a year's back pay to the employee for the time when she stopped showing up to work out of fear of encountering the stalker. So those are the 10 cases that Judge Barrett is most proud of. I hope I could paint a better picture of her judicial philosophy. What if anything did you learn? I'd love to hear your takeaways in the comments. Until next time, I'll see you in court. Thank you and that's all I have to say about that. Hello YouTube! First I'd like to thank my patrons here for helping me put out my videos. If you want to support independent nonpartisan news looking into the courts, join this growing list of exceptional individuals by clicking on that link in the description. If you want to hear my other coverage of the courts, click here. Remember to smash that subscribe button like it's a gavel in a groundbreaking court case. And ring that bell so that freedom will continue to ring. Give me a thumbs up if you like what you saw. And lastly, as always, thank you for watching.